Hello, welcome to the Gentle Rebel podcast. I'm Andy Mort, and this is a show about engaging with creative spirit, deep sensitivity, and playfulness to make more space for peace, meaning, and connection in a world that doesn't often give us chance to slow down and catch our breath. I hope you're doing well. So last time I talked about the idea of sound, personal sound in relation to creative spirit, um, and how we all have kind of natural ways of sensing, observing and noticing the world around, within and between us. In this episode, I'm kind of building on that by diving into the second element of creative spirit, which is noise. What does noise sound and feel like? Where might it creep in for each of us? We're going to think about how it impacts our day-to-day experience of things and what we can do with it so that it doesn't drown out that sound that we have in our core and also how we might use it, play with it and even integrate certain aspects of it into our voice, which is the third part that we're going to explore um, next time. We move through these three elements of creative spirit in my uh, one-to-one fireside coaching program, which I created essentially to help people reconnect with the way that they sense the world, how they see, feel, hear, smell, taste and laugh with it. Um, And it helps people basically become aware of the interference or the noise that disconnects them from that natural, playful, uh, I don't know, childlike creative spirit. Uh, And then finally, we kind of identify ways to express the creative voice uh, in different arenas of life, whether through a specific creative project, uh, in relationships, the workplace, or in conjunction with other goals and ambitions that someone might have. And so I'm sharing some of the kind of core principles, I suppose, that we follow uh, in that program on these episodes. And so, I mean, if they do resonate uh, with you and you feel like, oh, yeah, it'd be kind of interesting and useful to explore this uh, in depth with me, then you're welcome to swing by and work with me one to one. The program's like three to six months. Uh, it'd be worthwhile. Lots of fun. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. You can find out more. Um, by going to the-haven.co uh, slash fireside. Um, but yeah, let's get into the noise. So uh, starting with a definition, I suppose that's that's usually the, the best place to begin. Uh, what do I mean when I talk about noise? And where does noise come from? So noise might commonly be thought of as like a sensory disturbance. You know, it's obviously most... Um, commonly equated with sound, um, kind of noise coming through the ears. But I like to expand it. I think about it in relation to all the senses. So our thinking as well and bodily sensations. It's a kind of a physical experience of noise. Um, All of these arenas, all of these uh, places of experience allow us to detect noise in life. We can sense, encounter and feel disturbance in many ways, can't we? And we can experience the same stimuli as noise or what I think of as buzz. Um, this is not a technical term, um, but I, I like it. For, it kind of helps to distinguish between uh, two things. So buzz is like stimulation that adds to the environment or adds to the situation or experience we're in. I noticed this. Uh, during lockdown, you know, watching sport where crowds weren't allowed in stadiums and arenas to, to watch sports. So uh, there was a kind of eerie silence as they started playing um, playing games and, and matches um, without, without a live crowd there. A sport crowd makes a lot of noise, um, but it also contributes to the atmosphere. In fact, it kind of makes the atmosphere as I say, there's something eerie about being in an empty stadium watching sport. It is lacking something that is quite important. Noise, on the other hand, interferes with the signal and it interferes with the experience. It takes something away from um, the thing that we are wanting to be focused on. You know, it might not even be louder than the buzz, um, but it distracts you from the focal point. 
for example, you know, if you've ever been uh, in like, I don't know, a, a concert hall or in a, a sports stadium and you, people keep asking you to stand up so they can go and get more drinks or go to the toilet or whatever it is when you're trying to watch this this game or this performance, that's really noisy. It distracts you. It pulls your attention from what you're there to do. Um, well, think about being in a, a busy coffee shop. You know, if you're there with someone for a chat about something important, it's a lot harder if there are lots of other people in that environment having separate conversations. It's harder to tune into um, what the other person is saying and also to hear yourself thinking so that you can respond in, in ways that um, contribute to the reason that you're there. You know, the noise is excess sound that isn't helpful to the signal that you're trying to focus on listening and responding to that person you're with but if you're in there because you enjoy people watching and you you're just sort of soaking in the buzz of this slice of life it's not going to feel like noise because the stimulation is the point it's the reason that you're there and so it can be kind of helpful to distinguish between noise and buzz because it gives us a way to uh, get to the focus to understand whether or not the environment is supporting uh, the needs of the moment and supporting the needs that we have in the moment. For some people, silence is the noisiest distraction of all. You know, they need some buzz to keep focused and motivated. When the environment is too quiet or uh, there's not enough going on around them, they're kind of, you know, itching to reach for something to add a bit of buzz to that situation. You know, this is one of the frustrations that people who work in open plan offices talk about trying to navigate a world where, you know, one person's buzz is another person's noise and one person's noise is another person's tranquility. You know, it's not that either one of these is is the right way of being or is wrong, but it's really important to consider because it requires navigation, negotiation, empathic understanding to really get to that point where you can make it work for everybody in that same sort of sharing that same space. So, um, yeah, let's start at the the basic level of noise then. That's, that's sensory noise. Uh, in terms of the sources of noise, where noise um, can come from in life. So sensory noise is the stimulation that directly enters our senses. Noisy sounds, tastes, smells, touch sensations, sights... <laughs> It becomes noisy when it overwhelms our ability to process it or to receive information through our other senses. You know, I sometimes think about um, family holidays growing up and, you know, we'd be driving often sort of long, long trips and we'd be listening to music in the car. Um, and then as we sort of got close to our destination, my dad would always uh, turn the music off, you know, needing to concentrate, needing to figure out, OK, we need to sort of hone in on on the place that we're getting to here. And it wasn't that he needed to hear better, <laughs> but the music went from contributing to the vibe, contributing to the uh, to the joy of that situation, to keeping us entertained, to, you know, being a point of, I don't know, focus or whatever. Um, it went from that to becoming a distracting noise that stopped him from noticing what he needed to notice. I remember understanding this myself for the first time uh, when driving many, many years ago uh, and I had someone in the passenger seat who kept on sort of just turning the volume up on the music that we were listening to. I was like, that's quite annoying. Um, and I would just like notch it back down a little bit and then he'd put it back up. As you can imagine, this was pretty irritating. And eventually I was like, you know, can we just keep it at the this level that I have put it at? Because, you know, it's hard to concentrate if it's too loud. That put an end to the to the argument, if you could call it an argument, <laughs> the, the back and forth. Um, but I don't know, the situation also demonstrated another aspect of noise, which is control. Um, so if I'm in full control of the volume, it feels less noisy than if somebody else is, is controlling that input. Um, and so having somebody else sort of cranking up the volume um, can sort of add a different type of of noise. Um, and it might be that, you know, it might be the volume itself. It might be the choice of music. It might, whatever the, the thing that you're, that is outside of your control 
is um if it's not your preference it can add to the noise it's like the the noise of music coming through the wall um from a neighbor or or even sort of work like drilling you know you, you hear sort of uh, work going on next door or somewhere else it's more tolerable if you have some uh well a perception that you have some control over it um than if you don't know what it what it is why it's there you haven't turned it on or whatever that sort of adds another layer another level to the noise that is beyond the volume itself it's beyond the actual sensory um, stimulation it kind of then gets into your thinking and the stories that you tell about it um and so this gives us a nice bridge to consider the noise that can come from within us as well you know the stories that we tell ourselves when my passenger kept turning the volume back up that was additional noise, thoughts, stories I was telling myself about his lack of respect, <laughs> his rudeness, his, his annoying, annoying, annoyingness. I don't know what the word is there. Um, but yeah, we, we encounter a huge amount of noise, don't we, through our thoughts, through the stories, through the beliefs that, that kind of go on within us. Uh, much of it goes by without us noticing. And so our um, our inner critics also contribute to this. The voices, the stories, the messages that judge what we're doing, where we are, our chances for success in any given moment. Um, some have noisier inner critics than others. And the level of distraction that might come from the inner critic might depend uh, on where we are, what we're doing. Um, and yeah, the other things surrounding the stories that we're telling ourselves about particular um, places and activities. Um, then there's cultural noise. So I wasn't sure where to put uh, mobile phones into the list of noise sources because uh, they can really touch on a number of them. In fact, the phone, you know, social media especially, can be a trigger for every source of noise. Sensory noise, you know, the news feed scrolling, the visual chaos on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, sort of shorts, all of those things where it's just bang, 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 one thing after another, just this constant flow of um, of noise that doesn't have a resolution. It's just there's always this constant feed of new things coming. Then the inner critical noise, the stories we tell ourselves based on comparison. So you might sort of get a glimpse of someone's day maybe it's like a, an image that flies past a video a quote a caption something that someone's sharing and then that might trigger off some sort of comparison um like thoughts in our in our minds and the inner critic starts to create stories um and so then cultural noise as well this includes things like current events news stories trends um, that flow into our conscious awareness from elsewhere, often momentary. Uh, they come today, they'll be different tomorrow. Um, and, you know, cultural noise takes up thinking space. It takes up feeling capacity. Um, and it feels really important a lot of the time, but often has no real productive or constructive uh, outlet for us to um, to process it and then to release it. So it builds um, in our awareness, it stacks on top of yesterday's news, the day before, like all of these things just stack together. And there's this sort of growing, um, cultural noise that, that can really take up a lot of our energy and a lot of our capacity for, um, for clear thinking. This also includes like commentaries and reactions from other people to various phenomena that we, um, encounter or that's coming, um, into, into our awareness through the trends that um, our phones will deliver to us. It might take up space in our conversations, you know, our everyday conversations in as we're sort of going about daily life, find ourselves maybe searching for information about these things that we actually have no real direct or active impact on ourselves and which don't have necessarily a direct or active impact on us. This stuff becomes noise when it distracts us from what matters most other types of cultural noise might be a little less obvious you know the collective values and beliefs that we judge ourselves by the injunctions to keep up the fear of missing out 
that we acquire self-worth through uh, accomplishment and achievement by being endlessly productive. These might be examples, but also, you know, things like don't get above your station, put other people's needs first, be a good boy or be a good girl and so on. These stories that we absorb and integrate over time can drown out intuitive responses and that kind of gut feeling observation that we talked about relating to our personal creative sound. These are like noise filters on an analog synthesizer. They bypass certain frequencies from the source sound, taking away some of the depth, some of the body, some of the richness that might otherwise be there. I'm reminded of a quote from Dylan Moran. People will kill you over time and how they'll kill you is with tiny, harmless phrases like be realistic. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, like somatic or physical noise from sort of out of the head, out of the cognitive into, into the physical. Because we can feel noise in our physical beings. It might be experienced as, as pain, as tension, tightness, achiness, throbbing, tenderness, and so on. This can be how we hold unprocessed thoughts, emotions, and experiences. It can also become a source of noise itself. You know, the symptom of unprocessed noise becomes a source of separate amplified noise, like how a headache might be caused by something underlying it. But the headache as a symptom becomes a distraction itself to the point of being unable to focus. So physical sensations can be both an expression and a source of noise in that sense. Likewise, emotional noise, unacknowledged and unprocessed emotional responses to environments, situations, people, encounters, experiences. These can all build up inside our bodies and minds and, and spirits as noise. And this can become so loud that it starts to influence how we perceive and how we even experience the reality that we're part of. I use the role of music in film and TV as a way to um, to kind of encapsulate this um, and imagine it. There are some absolutely fantastic examples of how music can completely change what you believe that you're seeing in front of you. Depending on what you're hearing, you might see the exact same scene and interpret it as a, a sinister and foreboding situation or as a whimsical and magical thing. Um, I'll pop some videos in the show notes that demonstrate what I mean. Um, there's some great stuff. There's also um, a, re- a, a fantastic series of videos done by, uh, I think, a variety of different people. It's kind of a trend for a while. Uh, I'm sure there's a l- whole load of them for different um, programs now, but um, the one that got really got me um, sort of into this was, was a Breaking Bad, the sitcom. Um, which kind of added like Curb Your Enthusiasm style music and then a canned laughter track to some of the scenes from the show. And it changes everything. (laughs) It sort of changes how you see and what you see. It turns high intensity dramatic scenes that carry a real sense of threat um, into lighthearted, absurd comedic scenes. Um, And if you don't know the original um if you've not seen the original breaking bad your assumption would be that it is a comedy it's incredible how it how it's been done and i think this can be a really helpful reminder that what we hear is how we see a lot of the time and it might be that we're hearing something that completely flavors the reality that we perceive you know i'm often amazed at how Two people can see the same situation or hear the same words and have such wildly different interpretations to the extent that they might kind of use these words, they use this situation to justify and confirm their position. And these two people are in completely opposing camps, but they see this thing as supporting the position that they take because they've heard it in completely different ways. When our mind and our body are loaded with noise, we're less able to process nuance and subtlety 
And we naturally seek information in sync with uh, confirmation bias so that we filter everything through its usefulness in re- reinforcing that preconceived position and belief that we um, have already decided to take, whether we realize it or not. So by understanding how sound influences our perception, we can actually work with it to gently reshape the world that we encounter, the world that we believe we're part of, the world that's around us. We can play with the dials on the mixing desk. In some situations, environments and contexts, we have a lot more influence over the noise than we might think. Not every situation, obviously. Um, But yeah, if we spend a lot of time online, we might encounter a skewed reality based on algorithmic overwhelm through sameness. You know, I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating because it's incredible to see how this plays out. Um, The way that social media algorithms I think are fundamentally damaging to creative spirit because they deliver a really narrow and warped impression of reality. They show us this thing at at scale, um, this set of uh, content that all adheres to particular um, messaging or like particular things that have a sameness to them. Um, And they, so it seems like it looks like there's nothing on the horizon but this thing. So this is how the world is. And they amplify the noise with the message. You know, if you like that, you'll like this. Or if you care about that, you'll care about this. Um, And don't communicate the fact that this is just a tiny little drop in this ocean of content. Um, And so noise as repetition and indistinguishable clutter that stops us from focusing on the, on the most important things or being able to see that there are, other things beneath all of this. So I think algorithms are a source of noise, um, a massive source of noise, um, and they set up the soundtrack in our system. uh, And it can be really, really difficult to pull ourselves out from it because, you know, as you try to change what the algorithm is serving you, it just starts to, you know, I used that example of the porridge in um, a previous episode. It, it's like, right, okay, he likes this then, and then just completely overwhelms and oversaturates your world with this other thing. And so it paints this all-encompassing picture of extreme versions of reality. Rabbit holes that are hours alone. You know, this is, it's amazing to compare, um, to compare news feeds with other people. Like we might notice this in conversations where it's like their algorithm shows them completely different things. Like nothing of the sort that our timelines are flooded with. And you try and have a conversation. It's like, I've never heard of that person. And, you know, you're talking about trying to talk about someone who is an enormous superstar in a particular silo or rabbit warren um, that we've descended into. And it's like, I've never, I don't know who you're talking about or what you're talking about. Um, And yet for us, it feels like, well, that's all anyone's talking about, isn't it? It's like, no. Um, it's quite scary, really, what the what the algorithms do. Um, and even if we find the algorithm providing things that we that we really enjoy, um, you know, if we have avoided the, that the temptation to um, to doom scroll or to to sort of go with the the rage clicking, um, which can easily happen, especially when everybody adheres to this, uh, you know, creating like on YouTube, creating titles that basically get the the morbid curiosity going and pull us into uh you know someone destroys someone else or somebody completely owns this but and yeah even if you've sort of managed to avoid those sorts of videos the risk of being overwhelmed by sameness still exists and we might find ourselves feeling burned out by the volume of stuff that i don't know you can't help but feel is is competing us or competing with us and just driving us into the ground. You know, it shows us bigger and better than we're capable of. It shows us this endless stream of people doing similar things. And it's like, hi, everybody in the whole world's doing this thing that I really want to be doing. And they're doing it so much better than me. So what's the point? And so in this sense, noise diminishes capacity it squeezes our energy 
and leaves us feeling um, distracted and drained. And in the context of, of algorithms and the soundtrack playing in our minds, when we believe the world we're presented with is how the world is, we see the world and everything in it with that playing inside us. So like with the, the funny music and the laughter soundtrack, like if we're primed to find something funny, we're likely to find reasons to laugh. If we're ready to find something enraging, we're more likely to find reasons to be angry. So what is the soundtrack priming us to see? Does the radio station playing in our nervous system fit the world that we want to be part of creating? Or is it showing us a world that we actually want to keep at arm's length? Or are we kind of numb to it altogether, checked out, just like clicking on things, just being like, you know, oh, the world's really in a terrible state. And then you're reinforcing that by clicking through the noise, more and more noise. Maybe that's the case. Um, and if it is the latter, we can take that as a sign, not that the world is terrible, but that we might want to change the channel a bit and reshape what we allow to play on the soundtrack. You know, it doesn't mean turning everything off completely, but it means recognising how much perception is influenced by what we have primed ourselves to see, what we are uh, alert to, to seeing and to noticing, and how much um, what we see is delivered because of what we keep clicking on and allowing into our sphere of awareness. So from here, we might think about the question of, you know, what to do with the noise. Jean Cocteau said, listen carefully to first criticisms made of your work. Note just what it is about your work that critics don't like, then cultivate it. That's the only part of your work that's individual and worth keeping. What the public criticises in you, cultivate. It is you. You might be wondering what that has to do with noise. Um, I think of the noise of shame that comes when we encounter criticism as a question of ourselves. Shame is one of the noisiest things that we can ever deal with, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I feel it in every part of my mind and body. It fills my head. It blocks my ears. It makes tunnel vision kick in. My body goes tight, tense, unable to flex. I think this is you know, a metaphor for my thinking as well. Everything becomes consumed by this message of shame. I can't see clearly. I can't think clearly. I can't hear anything objectively. But it's also a clue to what matters most, to who I am. And like that cocktail quote, it can provide a pathway toward the things worth cultivating. Once we move through the immediate uh, racket of it, uh, noise becomes an invitation to explore and play with our place in the world. Shame often tells us ways in which we don't belong. And it implies that we must hide part of ourselves and change in order to fit in. Not because it's who we really are, but because who we really are isn't okay. It's not acceptable. But what if we found truth and liberation in those aspects that don't belong? What if it is in the noise that we find more aspects of our creative sound? What the public criticises in us, cultivate. It is us. What doesn't fit the world but feels completely normal for us, cultivate. It is us. It's like the idea that the obstacle is the way. This is something um, you might hear Stoics talk about, how the challenge or the obstacle that we think is blocking us from getting where we want to go, where we think we want to go, is actually going to be the thing that helps us grow as we navigate and overcome that challenge, that obstacle. So if we equate the obstacle with the notion of noise, you might think of the noise itself as playing a formative part in the way that we um, express ourselves, the way that we find our way on the path ahead. You, know, you might think of examples like people who uh, integrate loss and grief, like unexpected life changes into the story of their life. They become 
kind of infused aspects of the next chapter and the way that someone expresses their voice in the world, the thing that then, you know, motivates them, drives them on, uh, incorporates that obstacle into it, turning our pain into creative offerings that help us reconcile and process that situation and also connect with other people who might be going through uh, similar things or preparing the way for others who will encounter similar things in the future. This is, of course, not always applicable or relevant. You know, sometimes noise just needs to be dealt with. It's a needless distraction that can be turned down, toned down, diluted or dissipated somehow. This can mean changing aspects of the environment that we're in, where the noise is kind of emanating from, doing its thing. It might mean tweaking routines, developing new habits, removing activities or changing the times of certain things that we do. You know, I know for me, if I read the news first thing in the morning, it can derail me and put me in an unpredictable state of mind, um, like for the foreseeable future, maybe even for the whole day. Um, and so it's worth thinking about those subconscious cues that stimulate undesirable actions, the things that actually, I don't want to be doing that. So what is it that cues that behavior? Okay. Let's think about how we can eradicate that source of noise or that thing that will lead to a source of noise becoming, um, part of our day. So maybe, I mean, start by checking in with the nervous system. Like what puts your nervous system in a state of safety and connection, cultivating a sense of energized and motivated hopefulness. Build the environment and routine around those things first so that noise has less possibility of inadvertently getting in and saturating the situation. Because the truth is, most of the noise that derails our day gets in because we don't have solid supportive boundaries. And by, by that, I mean boundaries that keep the important things front and center. While boundaries are sometimes focused on keeping something out, like that's the, the primary objective of them, i.e. eliminating distractions, keeping the noise away. Like the, I have my boundaries to keep the noise out. Actually, it takes up more energy to hold something at bay than it does to prioritize things that organically as a byproduct will keep out the noise because they leave no room to let that in. But the focus is on the thing, the positive thing instead of the um, thing you want to eradicate. And so this is a, a subtle difference, but it has a huge impact. Like if you protect family time, for example, so make, uh, dinner with the kids, a non-negotiable part of your day. Like every day, this is the most important thing is, um, this 30 minutes, 45 minutes to have, uh, dinner with the kids. You don't give distractions a second thought before saying no, if they're going to impose on that time. But if you think, um, I'll try saying no to everything so that I can make more time. Maybe we can have family dinners because that would be really nice. The focus being on the distractions rather than the desire is, it kind of opens the door to, to drift creeping in. And that's where noise can build over time. Um, I was thinking about um, a, a classroom. I don't know if I can describe this properly, but I, I bet you know what I mean. It might, might be a, a classroom with a, a group of kids when you're a, when you're a kid that comes to mind, or it could be like a, I don't know, training situation or whatever. When a, um, when a teacher gets the room to be silent, so everybody's there like in total silence, okay, just getting on with their work. And then the murmuring begins. It's like a little bit of... And then over time, it gradually grows in volume and the murmuring becomes a, a bit more, a, sort of a bit louder and it kind of drifts to, the, to this tipping point and you, <laughs> until you see it occur to the teacher, like, oh, hang on a second. Like it's got really noisy in here. Um, and something, you know, they might not have noticed as it's drifting to this crescendo. Um, but there's a tipping point where it's like, wait a second, <laughs> everybody shut up. Um, and noise can be like that. You know, we might not notice it increasing 
in volume sometimes until it reaches some point of crescendo that, you know, who knows what, what it is that it, that it sort of triggers that. Um, but then it might cause this crash and this burn, um, as we, as we head over that tipping point. Um, so it's, I think it's worth remembering that small tweaks, uh, can lead to big changes over time. You know, in that sense, you know, to the, the drift can take us in undesirable directions, but we can also use it. Um, you know, if we're stuck in old patterns and perspectives, stories that might have been helpful um, at one time, they can turn into uh, noise when we're trying to navigate a world that has changed since those stories and beliefs um, had their purpose. So asking questions such as, you know, what is important to me now? What do I want to believe about people as I encounter them today? What do I want to notice more as I move through my day or I move through this week? And by taking ourselves out of familiar environments where we might not notice the noise, we can gently reshape, reset our system. You know that feeling when a fan suddenly turns off um, or something that's been sort of an environmental background noise suddenly turns off and you only notice the noise because it's no longer there. It's like, whoa, suddenly it's like gone really quiet. And it's the same with all kinds of situations and relationships, environments. It's not necessarily obvious just how noisy they are until maybe somebody takes a day off (laughs) or we try something different, whatever it might be. But even from a simple mindset perspective it can be worth playing with this and i think that's where we're going to finish for this episode with the idea of of kind of a simple intention like is there an intention that you could set yourself to play with this week for example maybe you're facing a noisy situation of some kind and it feels uncertain or it feels overwhelming in some way um what if you could set an intention to see one beautiful thing in it the next time you encounter it or set an intention to identify a point of safety or a point of refuge in a situation that feels um, threatening or scary in some way might be an intention to find um, and notice good faith in somebody that you disagree with or a glimmer of joy around something that feels otherwise bleak and hopeless Notice how it feels to set that intention. What's different about that? Note the points of resistance and the stories that might emerge in an effort to drown out the intention. And notice what happens when the intention is allowed to breathe. What possibilities does it open up for you? How does it impact your mood? Do you feel different? Do your thoughts sound any different? And notice how your anticipation informs what you notice and how what you notice impacts your well-being. Don't overanalyze. Just experiment, observe and record what you discover along the way. I would love to hear how you get on if if this is something that um you want to do and it appeals to you um drop me a message as well if anything's resonated uh, with you in this episode i'd love to to know what that is um yeah it'd be great to hear of your um your experiences and your responses to uh, these ideas that we are um, looking at email me through the contact form on my my website andymort.com or you can get in touch via social media or leave a comment in the show notes uh, or on the show notes <laughs> at the bottom of the show notes. Uh, yeah. And if you would like to find out more about the fireside program where we can get into this stuff together, um, then as I said earlier, just go to the hyphen haven.co forward slash fireside. Um, and yeah, there'll, there'll be a link in the show notes for that as well. 
All right. Well, great hanging out as always. Um, we will leave it there for this week and I will be back again next time with another episode of the Gentle Rebel podcast. And until then, remember that you are an artist. The world needs your art. Now go and make somebody's day. Bye-bye. <laughs>